that's kind of like what we really think about at Thunder is like, is there a way to like kind of change that chicken and egg problem where yeah. it's like, okay, can we actually just let people play a game? That you know they're totally familiar with the App Store, Google Play. Everyone's downloaded an app or yeah. Google or or a game. Yeah. You download it, you play, and you win. And boom, you have Bitcoin. Hmm. And now you have skin in the game, right? Mm-hmm. Which I think is really powerful. Like no one's gonna just delete the app yeah. if they have something that might be worth money in it. Right. And so they're just like the nature is like okay, well, what do I do? So yes. we suggest them that they download a wallet. And like actually have the Bitcoin themselves. And so we're really, we consider ourselves the top of the funnel where it's like, yeah. hey, we can capture all of these users and introduce them to Bitcoin and prime them for like what's next, what's further down the rabbit hole. First, so it's cool. like wallet of Satoshi or, you know, a custodial wallet. And then we like very quickly bring them to like non-custodial solutions. We recommend hardware wallets yeah. and really bring them down that journey. But first and foremost, we don't really talk about bitcoin at all that's so cool we talk about the joy of playing yeah. which i think is the best way to do it yeah hey everybody welcome to the what is money show i am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the collection of money Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the world's first startup accelerator program focused exclusively on the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what is possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com today to apply for the program or learn more. Again, that is wolfnyc.com. Des Dickerson, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. So glad to have you here. Uh, Just by way of quick introduction, you are the CEO of Thunder, which is a mobile games platform powered by Bitcoin. Uh, As a longtime gamer myself, I'm, I'm retired now. I don't play video games anymore, although I do often think about going back. Um, I'm really interested to learn like how you got into this world. I mean, I think you kind of have a dream job, I think, for someone that played video games as a kid, right? You get to do it all day. Yeah, I, I, I definitely have a dream job. Like our entire team knows they have dream jobs. Like Mondays, everyone's like, GM, good morning, good morning. Like Mondays are our favorite day. So <laughs> it is like a true blessing. Um, yeah, I, I grew up playing video games with my dad. It was like our father-daughter bonding time. Um, it was really special when my parents got divorced when I was young. So it yeah. was like really a big, big part of like my family life with my dad and my sister. And you know, we grew up playing um, NES and, you know, Duck Hunt and Rad Racer. And you know, we tra- I feel like our, I don't know, our relationship has like transitioned between platforms. It was like, I remember <laughs> when we got the N64 and my dad and I would play GoldenEye together. I love GoldenEye. Yeah. 
so good and then like the we and like even now today like you know we live in different states but he's like oh he gave me his la- his copy of last of us and it's like you've got to finish you've got to finish and so it's been a really important part and like now it's so cool to see him playing my games and like calling me he's like so pissed like i can't make it to this league like <laughs> i'm your dad like can't you just give me free vip subscription and so it's been a really really big part of like my family and so it's so fun to like actually come back to it and be totally immersed in this industry now well, that is super cool so was it did he inspire that like he's the one that started playing games with you or like were you asking for like how did that emerge yeah he's been a gamer okay um, he's a gamer. From, from from the beginning um and so yeah he kind of always drove that i i i, I recently saw like a home video of him getting his nes like mm-hmm. i think it was before i was born and i was like oh. It's so cute, but it's also been like a really cool way to introduce him to Bitcoin because, yeah. you know, I've been in this industry for forever now, I feel like, um, you know, coming out of Lightning Labs and you know, doing a lot of really awesome work there. It's been a really cool way to like really show my family like this is what Bitcoin is because they all get gaming. Even my mom is like a mobile gamer, yeah. plays these like mystery games. And so now they can play the games and actually understand yeah. what i'm working on whereas before they were like you work where you do what right. and now that they can touch it like they really really understand what's going on that's so it's like bridging those worlds which is a lot of what you're doing right yeah. at thunder bridging yeah. the gaming world with bitcoin yeah what were your favorite games growing up well golden eye was definitely like one of the best for me but also um animal crossing Animal Crossing. Yeah. I know of it, but I didn't play it. Yeah, it's a good one. I I think you might like it. It's more geared towards female audiences, but the mayor, t- Tom Nook, is like, he's just like the worst guy ever. He gets everyone in debt. Like, I like, you'll owe him like five million, like, I can't remember the currency in the game I haven't played for a while, but like, you'll owe him like five million dollars the minute you start. Oh, and good. you're constantly like paying your debt to him. And it's like, really sick. Wow. So it's like a fiat game. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a total yeah game, but it's really good. So, Animal Crossing is is definitely that, and Zelda. Right. Zelda, yeah. I loved Zelda. Yeah. I loved role playing games. Final Fantasy. Did you ever play that one? Yeah, no, yeah. That, that wasn't one of my faves. But no, like I yeah Final Fantasy seven. I think I got it when I was like seven years old, and you. It's like playing a novel, right? Like you're reading yeah. the whole thing, and I think that got me going on reading at a young age, which was pretty cool. Oh, that is really cool. Yeah. And Goldeneye was just, it was me, my brother, my cousin, and our my uncle. We'd play the four-player split screen and just, yes. we'd play it until our hands were like numb. It was oh. so good. Man, I gotta, yeah, I want to bring those days back. It's like, that to me was like pure gaming. It was like, you know, I don't know. Now now I find it like too hard to play, you know. Some of the games I'm like, oh my God, I, can't, I don't have the time to invest in like- That's how I feel, yeah. Like I'm horrible at Call of Duty. Um, I'm, I'm horrible at any of those like shooting games too, yeah. in general, so. Does it, so you're still a gamer? Yes. But has it gone down for you a little bit? I guess by virtue of working in it all the time, plus growing like I, very hard for me to give up gaming, by the way. Like even when I talk about it, I'd start to miss it. But um, like you said, I felt like there were just other priorities that take priority. Yeah, yeah, I think like it's definitely gone downhill. Um, I think, you know, also if you don't have someone in your life who loves it, like mm-hmm. my husband is like, yeah, 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 it's all right. And so like, you know, I don't have a ton of spare time, so I don't play as much. Also, you know, playing video games all day for a job right. is like, okay, just <laughs> someone give me a book. Yeah, like, right. <laughs> right, 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 right. Like, yeah. like, get me to the gym. Um, yeah. But so you do get a bit burnt out, but um, you know, I think now I just like test so many mobile games. So that's where I'm mostly spending my time, but like the new Zelda is coming out in March. Um, is that for the Nintendo Switch? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. My daughter and I just started playing that. And so we've been doing like Smash Brothers. So I guess I should, actually I am back to gaming. Who am I kidding? <laughs> I forgot. We've been playing a little bit of Smash Brothers and a little bit of Mario Kart. She's only four though. So she's like barely getting the hang of it, but. Yeah, that's like when I started playing. Like, you're going to have, Four. like, that same Four. thing that you and my dad had. <laughs> that's super. I, like, I guess I did it somewhat selfishly, actually. We were trying to figure out what to get her for Christmas. And I was like, oh, this looks great. This is get her this. We didn't even know if she would pick up on it, but she's picking up on it. Yeah. So, 
I mean, yeah. I think it's important. I mean, if you think about games, like there's such a great way to like learn about things. Like obviously like the Bitcoin piece, but it's like, I feel like I learned all of my problem solving, mm -hmm. like skills, all of like my like kind of strategic mindset. Like, I mean, I did strategy and operations consulting. It was like, I learned that all from playing video games. Yes. It's like I went to like public school. Like I wasn't, you know what I mean? Yeah, so same. I feel like I learned all of this on like a PC or a console. Yeah. No, I completely agree because when we were growing up, it was pretty looked down upon, right? Yeah. Like you're wasting your time. What your parents didn't think there was much utility in playing video games. But looking back, you asked me offline, like what was my favorite video game? And I answered with the one that I spent the most hours on, which was Diablo 2. Yeah. And that game, like you learn a lot about economics, strategy, like goal setting, work like you had to build the character and live in the world and compete and trade like it was it's a microcosm of life in a way and yeah. you i wasn't getting that education in school yeah so yeah i'm sure it had a lot to do with like the career path i chose or getting into digital assets and and whatnot yeah so. i think it was what you said earlier was really interesting about like you know people using gaming you you referenced earlier about using games as a way to like test and like figure out morality you mm -hmm. mentioned that and it's like i do feel like the games are like a test bed for us to like you know figure out who we are like you know mm -hmm. you, you get these games where it's like splinter cell like i was i mean i shouldn't admit this but i was always doing the bad thing like yeah, i always yeah. but i was like i'm just gonna do it because i'm not like this in real life <laughs> and i can also feel the consequences so i feel like it's like you can learn a lot about yourself you can learn a lot about like everything like yes. you say like bartering yeah um you know like out these like external markets around um diablo too so i yeah. think like games are a perfect way for us to like teach people about an even new newer technology which is bitcoin because right. it's like hey i'm having fun but in the back we're like learning whereas like you know when we we're young like no set an econ book in front of us and i'd be like no 100 percent, yeah but like a game right yeah you, you don't even intend to learn about economics right like I, as i was telling you i started playing so for the people that may not know what this is it's kind of like a Dungeons and Dragons video game, I guess is kind of the best way. Yeah. If you're a dungeon crawler. <laughs> and so you're running around fighting demons and all that. But there, you could exit the game and go into these trade channels where people were trading equipment, you know, the swords and the helmets and all that. And started out playing the dungeon crawler game, but over time started playing the trade channels more often. And that became like my thing. I was like buy low, sell high, you know, yeah. arbitrage and get wealthy in the game. And it was so cool like to go through that experience. And then people started selling those items eventually on eBay for real money. Yeah. And that was like very impactful on me. I'm like, oh my goodness, this game I've been playing is like real, like it's real economics. And the other thing that was super cool was there was no money in the game, but there was this little tiny ring. You only had like 40 spaces you could put items on. And this ring only took up one of the spaces. So it was very divisible, I guess you would say. And people started pricing things in terms of that ring. It was called the Stone of Jordan ring. So they'd price everything in SOJs. So there's like a, an emergent currency in this little free market. And so I guess that kind of left a mark too. It's like, oh, you know, money is not a thing someone imposes. It just emerges. Yeah. I mean, I think there's like things that are like inherently human and it's one like social interactions, it's play. Mm. It's also the transfer of value. And mm. I think those things just like, they're always going to be intertwined and any time that someone like takes one out or you know tries to control one like people will evolve their own set with like yes. games there's no value transfer but people create it on their own yes yeah. it's really powerful yeah yeah and as you said offline too they tried in diablo 3 to like that was like a naturally that was a free market basically it just happened yeah but they tried to the game designers tried to control that in diablo 3 and it didn't work it like it was a disaster what, how do you guys think about that in your world, like game design, game economics? Do you try to lean more free market or do you try? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we approach everything with like a free market mindset almost. Um, you know, just in general, the way that we build is like we let our users drive everything. Mm -hmm. You know, when NFTs were a big thing in gaming, we were like, honestly, like at the end of the day, this is a business or Bitcoiners, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to listen to our users. Right. Only one person wanted an NFT. So we're like, 
Oh, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like, this is great. Um, but um, so we, we just let our users drive everything that we build. And so I think, you know, we'd been talking about where it's like so many game economies are destroyed or just like built like in a really poor fashion yeah. um, when, you know, someone is driving it. Then I, I think that selfishly have some type of like economic incentive to want to like warp the economy mm -hmm. to make money. So I think that's what was wrong with the Diablo 3 auction house. You know, it has mm -hmm. horrible, horrible, you know, reviews like. Yeah, oh. they canceled it eventually. <laughs> yeah. And they were, yeah. it was a direct, it was a, they were printing money basically, yeah. but they had to cancel it, it was so bad. Yeah, and I think that's why the, the games industry, that and like there are a few other examples that I think kind of turned the entire gaming industry against adding like real value to games. And so there was this huge lull and then, hey, we saw like this like play to earn, like Web3 mm -hmm. gaming happening and like with like Axie Infinity. And so, you know, then you were seeing like the total kind of opposite side of the spectrum where people are creating these really intricate, inti intricate, complex um, game economies. But like, again, we're built to only serve the gaming company itself. I mean, like Axie Infinity with their love potion was like, literally an inherently inflationary <laughs> economy oh. but like people bought into it and so i think the gaming industry like again is like very very tired and worn out of this like narrative of bringing real money to games but yeah. like i think that's why we're approaching it in the way where it's like hey we're gonna let the users drive this thing and you know the minute that they hate something we completely right. change it so i think again like the kind of economies that developed around Diablo 2 like that's what we want to see happen mm -hmm. um and like I think we're just like we, we don't intend to make money off yeah. of what the players are doing between themselves and we want to let that happen totally naturally and I think that's how you build a good game economy is by letting people drive it for themselves yeah just like how you build a real economy right <laughs> I, the, the, the free market <laughs> that's um that's super cool then for, so free markets then it's kind of like a centralization versus decentralization right because basically the the diablo 3 auction house was like a centralized thing they were just yeah. selling the items directly to people whereas in the old model people were just trading peer-to-peer -peer. right and so i think that speaks volumes to just the importance of peer-to-peer -peer markets yeah um super cool okay maybe do a little pivot here yeah, okay. you said something funny offline before we started okay. which was how you actually think nobody really gives a shit about Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, I think you meant outside of Bitcoiners. Yes. Um, how, what did you mean by that? And how do we change that? How do we break that bubble? Yeah, I know it's a hot take and I've had it for a while, but like it is like well-intentioned. Um, you know, I just kind of look at this bubble that we all sit in and we're kind of like, I don't know, like for lack of a better, better term, I'm sorry, it's like a circle jerk. Like <laughs> honestly, like, um, you know, we all think like, the echo chamber is a nicer word. The echo chamber. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, mom. Um, but um, and so I think we're all in this, this echo chamber and, you know, kind of pumping each other up. But if you like look outside of this, it's like what? Like, you know, people get excited about have, having 50,000 users and it's like, uh -huh. no, right. like that's not a scalable business. Right. And so I think, you know, and I see it with our games because, you know, when we launch a game, I see the peaks and like where where we peak with a ton of Bitcoiners and where we start to like, you know, kind of branch out right. um, for new users. And so I see it happening with us. And then I look around to the rest of the industry and I'm like, okay, like we're all just serving each other. Mm -hmm. And like, there's not a lot of us comparative mm -hmm. to like the entire world. So like, how do we actually branch out outside of this? Because like right now it's just, it's not working. Yeah, And we'll never grow it. And I think a big part of it is, is that people don't care. People don't yeah. care about Bitcoin. They, they don't have a reason to. And I think you had brought up like the reason that people will care about Bitcoin is because they will suffer so much pain yeah. that they'll have to be forced to onboard. And I think you see that now, like in the developing world, people get Bitcoin much more easily yeah. because they're subjected to more pain. But in the developed world, people don't give a shit about Bitcoin to your yeah. point. Yeah. So is there a way to save people before they need saving? Right, 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 right. Is, you know, like, does this have to be like 
the like Hail Mary pass at the end yeah. of the day when we're all like, you know, being like totally destroyed by some awful government. Like, and I think that's, you know, if it's actually going to flourish as like a really, I don't know, for Bitcoin to, re- to flourish as more than just, you know, this store of value, I think yeah. that we need to start solving that problem now. Um, so Bitcoin can be used in like all facets of our life rather than just like, oh shit, like I yes. got to save my money and my family yes. um, and I'm putting all my money into Bitcoin. Yes, right, right, right. Uh, one of the most intelligent things I think a person can do is learn from the mistakes of others. Mm-hmm. Very hard to do too because most of us need to learn the hard way. But if you can do it, you can get the lesson without the cost basically. Yeah. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized US dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. And so I think what you're saying is like, how do we push that into the world? How can we give people the Bitcoin orange pill without having them to experience the pain of inflation, regulation, taxation, whatever it may be? Yeah. Um, That sounds like maybe part of your mission then yes i mean it definitely is i mean if you think about it and you know i've been in the especially the lightning space for so long and there's just so many beautiful things being built i mean just incredible you know projects and and tech that's being built but it's like why would anyone care they have no incentive Mm -hmm. to care like if i was a total normie why would i go download a lightning enabled bitcoin wallet like that actually sounds painful <laughs> because I'm going to have to like find out which one's not a scam, which yeah. probably requires like finding the right Reddit, subreddit. Yeah. And then like also once you get it, you have to KYC, which might take one, two days, yeah. you know, literally have to sacrifice your firstborn in order to get set up. Yeah. And then what do you do? You then you spend your like hard earned money that on something that's like in your mind a very speculative asset yeah. that might be a total scam. Like really like that is like seven barriers yeah, yeah, for yeah. someone to want to get onboarded. Um, so that's kind of like what we really think about at Thunder is like, is there a way to like kind of change that chicken and egg problem where yeah. it's like, okay, can we actually just let people play a game that, you know, they're totally familiar with the app store, Google play, everyone's downloaded an app or yeah. Google or, or a game. Yeah. You download it, you play and you win and boom, you have Bitcoin. Hmm. And now you have skin in the game, right? Which I think is really powerful. Like no one's going to just delete the app if they have something that might be worth money in it. And so they're just like, the nature is like, okay, well, what do I do? So we suggest them that they download a wallet and like actually have the Bitcoin themselves. And so we're really, we consider ourselves the top of the funnel where it's like, hey, we can capture all of these users and introduce them to Bitcoin and prime them for like, what's next? What's further down the rabbit hole? First, so it's cool. like wallet of Satoshi or, you know, a custodial wallet. And then we like very quickly bring them to like non-custodial solutions. We recommend hardware wallets yeah. and really bring them down that journey. But first and foremost, we don't really talk about Bitcoin at all. That's so cool. We talk about 
the joy of playing, yeah. which I think is the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that is super cool. So it's kind of like gamifying Bitcoin adoption a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those barriers are significant, like yeah. especially considering most people don't give a shit about Bitcoin. Like, why are you going to go through all all that headache for something that you don't understand the why behind it, right? Yeah, and if you don't have like a Bitcoiner in your life, like why would you ever get off X? Yeah. Like, you're just going to constantly stay in the status quo because there's no incentive. It also doesn't sound fun or yeah. like appealing or anything. So You said something too offline that, that mobile gaming, you can't, because mobile gaming is so much more accessible, right? Where the video game paradigm, I, I guess we grew up in, it was like console or PC gaming. Um, those are expensive, right? And so yeah. a lot of people in the developing world don't have PlayStations, Nintendo 64, whatever. But everyone, most everyone has a smartphone. They can download a mobile app. So how, so mobile gaming being more accessible, more universally accessible, are you then leveraging that to basically deliver the Bitcoin orange pill? And like, how, how does that work? Yeah, and this is, you know, what really got me so excited um, about, gaming as the use case like a really good use case for the lightning network mm -hmm. when i was working at lightning labs it's like the the kind of prevalence of um like internet connected mobile devices like over the past 15 years it's mm -hmm. just connected the world and it's really you know first it's brought about like this whole new generation of gamers it's mm -hmm. like like you said you know most people in you know emerging markets can't afford you know five six hundred dollars for a console mm -hmm. or thousands of dollars for a pc mm -hmm. like my God, I can't afford that in this market. <laughs> and then, um, you know, then also just, you know, who was a traditional gamer? It was someone who was like younger, male, like in a, you know, a privileged household mm -hmm. um, with a significant income. And so, you know, you're not seeing people who like moms who are working three jobs, right? Mm -hmm. They're not playing these like Call of Duty right. games that take you have to spend hours playing. And so with the rise of mobile and these mobile games, people were able to to you know there's no barrier to entry you just download it mm -hmm. most of them are free most games have been freemium model for a while and then also just the style and nature of the games changed um you know they were like much shorter gameplay like you could do it just like waiting on the subway mm -hmm. or you know in between your meetings at work and so you're seeing i think 51 percent of mobile gamers are women or identify as women huh. and um you know most of like the biggest gaming markets um, for mobile games are, you know, Latin America. Like yeah. Free Fire is huge in Latin America and you're seeing the APAC region um, really have access to these um, mobile games. And if you think about it, these are also the audiences that are traditionally underserved when it comes to like financial access and financial oh, right, right. empowerment. Yeah. So if we can use these mobile games as a way to introduce like emerging markets and new demographics to Bitcoin, yeah. I think it's just like this really beautiful alignment of like um, the emergence of gaming and society and also, you know, coupling that with like the adoption of like a really beautiful like freedom technology. Yeah, wow, that is super cool. I'd never thought of that. And then you said earlier too, the mobile gaming marketplace in case anyone thought it was small, actually bigger than consoles and PC marketplace combined. Yes. So, the, I mean, the numbers of people playing mobile games must just be an order of magnitude higher than console and PC at least. Yes. I mean, I challenge anyone after listening to this to like get on a bus or a plane or literally go anywhere and see what people are doing on their phones. They're usually playing a game. It's going to blow your mind because right. people don't think about it until I ask them. Yeah. I mean, and also see how many people are playing solitaire. That is also shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that actually a lot when um, valets or other service personnel, like if you'll catch them on their phone, like so you give them money or whatever, and I'll I'll see their phones. Like they're usually playing a game. I'd say like nine times out of ten. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of them. So there is, if anyone's familiar, if you're familiar with skills, um, like they IPO'd recently, but they're a mobile game company mm. where you can win like real money rewards. Mm. Um, but it's impossible to cash out. Like my dad's girlfriend has been playing their solitaire for two years. Mm -hmm. She plays for like two hours a night and she's never met the threshold for cashing out. Wow. Yeah. Whereas in Thunder Games, it's just as soon as you get a sat, you can yeah. pull it out. Yeah. So wow. she's, yeah, she's obviously transitioned to all, our solitaire. Right. So. Now the, 
very noble mission, which I, I think it's super cool. You're leveraging mobile gaming to orange pill the world. It's funny how Bitcoin does that. It seems to turn everyone's business into like an orange pilling factory yeah. somehow, but yours is like very high leverage, it sounds like, which is interesting. But you also said that adding Bitcoin to mobile games is actually driving your long-term player retention significantly. So what's going on there? How is Bitcoin actually making these games more uh, attractive? Yeah, I mean, th we're definitely not a nonprofit and we wouldn't be here if we weren't intending on making money. Uh -huh. um, and so, yeah, we've, you know, we spent, spent the last year like really perfecting like what gamified rewards in a, a game should look like. Um, so we've A-B tested games, our games with Bitcoin, without Bitcoin, and it drives long-term retention around 516%, which is absolutely insane. Wow, that's staggering. Yeah, so if you think like your your D30 retention numbers are super high, you know, your LTV for users is going to be way higher. Mm -hmm. So um, our users are playing longer, they're interacting with more ads, which we make ad revenue off mm -hmm. of, um, they buy more things in the game in app mm -hmm. purchases. And if they're if we're making more money off of those users, we're able to like actually give a small percentage of that back in rewards. I right. mean, we don't give a lot, um, but you know, it keeps them around. Mm -hmm. And so we can actually like really harness um, some of these aspects of Bitcoin on the Lightning Network to keep people mm -hmm. in these games and get, keep them playing longer, but also reward them for being there. Wow. So yeah. does that like, you said these uh, microtransactions, you're using this to just get people spending more time in the games themselves? Yeah, because, um, you know, people win hourly in mm -hmm. most of our games, and so they just play every single hour. They're like, hey, can I win every hour? Because it's like, it's not like, oh, hey, it's nothing. It's just like a, a coin, a thunder coin. Right. You know, they know that it's they're going to, yeah, yeah, and they can cash it out immediately. Right. The minute they win it, it's theirs. And so it's every so it's a raffle. Is that what's happening every hour? Yeah, yeah. So we have gamified um, the way that prizes are structured a bit, just like based on like you know typical mobile yeah. games industry um, tactics. So it's yeah, you play, you like earn these tickets that enter you into a raffle, mm -hmm. um, and then every hour you can win Bitcoin. And there's some like meta game stuff that we're working on where it's like you can choose where to put your raffle tickets and what raffles to enter in and oh, cool. give our players like even more kind of leverage over like how they're choosing to earn their bitcoin so it's like a game of games almost. game of games that's super cool and then it you also use this to like influence player behavior to some extent how does that work yeah so um you know one thing that we saw was like okay you know people are playing our games like 80 percent of our users are totally new to bitcoin mm -hmm. which i think is like really incredible and a really great chance for us to like usher them through the rabbit hole like i mentioned and so you know for wallets you know why would anyone really want to go download a wallet but we can very heavily influence that mm -hmm. by saying okay hey like you're in the philippines right um you don't have a wallet this is your first time ever playing well we can present the users um the pouch wallet in a way that's like you know much more like branded in a, a fun a more fun way mm -hmm. and even um you know prime them by like placing like immersive advertising in the games and then offer increased incentives for doing things by like downloading the pouch wallet and also by doing things in the mm -hmm. pouch wallet and so we're able to create these like really interesting partnerships with like other bitcoin companies mm -hmm. where we can kind of share our brand new users with them and expose and give these Bitcoin companies like new user exposure. Um, so kind of using us as a vehicle for onboarding to their companies. Right, yeah, I think offline you said this, you're like priming these non-Bitcoin game players yeah. to become Bitcoiners effectively. Yeah. And so the gamification then goes across, like once they're in the wallet, you're gamifying them taking different actions inside the wallet to win rewards? Yeah, so they're in, that like really like highly depends on the wallet. Where sure. It's like, oh, hey, like if you purchase this in the wallet, maybe you'll get X in the game, mm, right? Gotcha. So there's there's really unique things that we can do and it's very wallet specific. And you know we're able to like really target like very specific, like we can target um, y like new users in one city in the Philippines mm -hmm. um, and, you know, really kind of work strongly with these um, Bitcoin companies who don't really have any user acquisition exposure. Um, so yeah, there's really interesting things that can kind of be done to like influence our users. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, obviously money is a very powerful incentive. And so you're like, you're leveraging uh, really good money, Bitcoin, yeah. right? To get people, even if they don't know it, which is interesting. Yeah, 
it's it's interesting i mean it's also this the other interesting thing like psychologically i think there is like a unit bias Mm -hmm. when it comes Mm. to like the like highly divisible nature of bitcoin where it's like people when they win like a thousand sats oh yeah oh yeah yeah oh my god they like lose their mind um because it feels like a lot right there are countless shit coins that have preyed on that very psychological view or whatever it is yeah yeah so we can actually use it if like hey this is actually a really wonderful currency that you're you're winning um so i think that's an also really cool thing that like isn't possible in in the fiat world at all yeah that's so cool why you mentioned the one where the girl had been playing solitaire for two years and never was able to withdraw what is the how how is that fiat rail obviously it's different because you're on bitcoin but what is it that's preventing her from being able to withdraw so i mean there are obviously like at some points it's not like it doesn't make like sense like as a business to cash out you know like you go to the store and like oh there's a five minute five dollar minimum for cashing out right there's a ton of transaction fees um and just like the like friction of the traditional fiat rails that like makes it difficult so that is like mostly where that threshold comes from Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's just like no incentive mm. either. So they have these crazy terms and cert- like terms and conditions mm. that make it impossible to ever cash out your reward because like, hey, it like looks like she has like ten dollars, but they're like, no, 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 you have to like get to a hundred mm. before you can cash out, and they make it absolutely impossible mm. to um cash to ever get to a hundred. Like right. it would take you twenty four hours a day. Right. So that, um, that makes sense. The fixed cost of moving money on those rails is so much higher that it, they have to set the limits much higher. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, I mean, I don't know if people are playing longer. I don't know exactly. They're like, but it doesn't seem like it's baked into their business model right. for us. Like we've baked into our business model. Like, hey, we're going to give away X right. percentage of like rewards to our users because we know how much money they're going to make us like from ads and in-app yeah, yeah. purchases. Um so it's like more of a revenue share for us, whereas for them it's like the minute that they have money go out the door, like right. they're losing the money. Right, 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 right. And you're even monetizing the money going out the door, right? But through integrating these wallets and whatnot too. Exactly. That's super cool. Okay. You mentioned a couple of books you've been reading. Yeah. They have kind of scary titles. They're really scary. Oh. But we're a really good company. Um, <laughs> um so I'll mention them, I guess. One is titled Evil by Design and the other is Addiction by Design. I assume these are just talking about the nature of gamifying experience. Yeah. So addic- um, Evil by Design, which this is the one that I'm like, I've started. I'm not all the way through, but right. most of the people on our team have read. It just it does just talk about like addiction mechanics, like how just the entire app industry has evolved to like really target user attention mm-hmm. and like really like keep it right. um on lock so we read those i mean the idea behind the book is like hey this is what has been done and it can be very evil mm-hmm. and really bad for people um but like here's how to use those mechanisms but like ideally you use them for good right. um so i mean we do use a lot of like the tried and true methods for keeping users around we recently launched leagues which is like a leveling system that allows our users to compete with each other um and that's like driven usage a lot Mm. you know solitaire before we launched leagues was um the average playing time per day per user was 38 minutes which Mm. is wild you know we had a one player who is like one of my favorite of our players very active in the Mm. community she was like i have to delete it have to delete (laughs) it for a couple weeks like i have to (laughs) <laughs> continue on in my life but i'm like okay, at least we've introduced you to bitcoin <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't have ever seen this and now you have bitcoin um, oh. and she's coming back for the new game but yeah i mean oh. like hopefully we can use those as those like kind of psychological behavior yeah hacks to make bitcoin like even more compelling for right people. so th- these books are about how to grab and keep attention through game design or mobile app design yeah but I mean, I don't, I don't know what I don't know here, but if you're using that, I think to get people the the orange pill, you might be using, I don't know, nefarious. I don't. It's not really nefarious if you're using a technique to keep get and keep people's attention, but you're taking them to the light of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. I mean, that seems like a good 
good direction to take people. Yeah, I mean, if they're not on our app, they're somewhere else, right? Yeah. Like they could be just like doom scrolling on TikTok, right? Or playing a game where they're actually spending money and think they're going to win something right. and never do. And so, you know, I mean, whether or not it is actually evil, what we're doing, I mean, I don't really think we are, but mm. we are definitely using like some of those techniques. Um, you know, hopefully they work and can help us spread Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, have you seen the documentary, The Social Dilemma? Did you watch that one? No. It's about a lot of that. And I felt they're talking about, I don't, is it the amygdala or something? That's like the, the apps are targeting this amygdala response. Oh, yeah. I might be naming the wrong part of the brain here. Um, but as I'm watching the documentary, I actually felt that occurring. Like I habitually wanted to check Twitter like three times yeah. through this one and a half hour documentary or something. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, these techniques clearly work and I'm habituated to them. Um, so it's a real thing we're dealing with. It's kind of this uncontrolled social experiment that we have this huge mobile app marketplace. We're all addicted to our phones to greater or lesser extent. And um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I will admit like, I, I did have to go to the ER recently for my, my foot breaking, but like I spent that week, I spent 13 hours on TikTok. Wow. I mean, I was at the ER to be clear right, right. for 15 You're... hours, but like, I mean, that's all I did the whole time was scroll through TikTok, which is all, like, that's crazy. Wow. What is it about TikTok? TikTok has the most addictively designed algorithm? Mm -hmm, for sure. How, how, what makes it different? What, what is it about TikTok? I mean, I think it's just like the, the feed is so tailored to anything that you're looking at or saying or doing at mm -hmm. the very moment. Like, it's just like anything that I'm thinking about. It reads your mind. Yeah. I'll be like, oh, you know, I'm like interested in like something like my hair feels really dry when I'm in the mountains. It's just TikToks about like different like hair hacks <laughs> and things. I mean, it's wild. Like, I mean, it, it can be really nice. Like I try and train the algorithm where it's like um, Jack, my co-founder and I, um, we'll talk a lot in TikTok DMs about work uh -huh. and then we'll start getting fed a lot of like really great like product design oh, content. Okay. So it's like our color blue that we use for like all the buttons is like the blue, very, very close to the blue that like Google uses. Cause like that's oh. been studied and they spent millions of dollars studying this color blue that like gets people to like click and like buy more often. Wow. Um, so, and we do try and use like their addiction tech to our benefit. Yes. Um, but you can definitely go down some bad rabbit holes. But you have to also, right? To Again, it's an uncontrolled social experiment. I'm sure there's a lot of negative consequences from all of this that we don't know, but there's always unforeseen consequences, but it's happening. Yeah. So if you're gonna play, if you're gonna compete in that arena, you have to employ the best tactics. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. At least you're taking people to Bitcoin. I feel like that gets you, that's like your get out of jail free card. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're not trying to destroy people's lives at yeah. the end of the day. If it becomes a really, big problem will pull back but um you know we the games are fun and that's right, why they're right, addicting right. it's not like oh hey like they feel like they're like going to go to hell for not right. like playing or something they are having fun um i mean like the micro dosed like sats that they get obviously kind of yes it over yeah more, but yeah. but that's a good karmic balance i think to whatever extent maybe these things are not good for people yeah. At least you're taking people to a good place with them. So <laughs> yeah, I'm going to let that let me sleep at night. Anyway. <laughs> right, good. I hope that helps. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to, there's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. 
By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Bitcoin Conference 2023. This three day event will be held May 18th through 20th in Miami Beach. Uh, this is going to be the biggest event of the year, as it always is. And the past two years in Miami have simply been amazing. Uh, day one's industry day. Days two and three are going to be open to general admission. And I'd say this is a great place to go and network with Bitcoiners or even look for a job. Uh, just a really all around great experience. There's a fantastic speaker lineup including Michael Saylor, Zoltan Pozar, Lynn Alden, Alex Gladstein, many others. And last year, we did a 10 million sats giveaway for this event, and we're going to do it again this year. So to get discounted tickets and enter for a chance to win 10 million sats, go to b.tc slash conference and use code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CASA. CASA makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, CASA provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, -A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. Um, you mentioned this, and you mentioned the launch of leagues. This is just the social competitive layer, I think you call it, where yeah, people competing it, yeah. against people, that drives a lot of uh, engagement with the game. Mm -hmm. We used to call that PVP back in my day, player versus player, and that was... That was the thing to do, really. Like once you got to a certain point of the game, you just wanted to go and compete with other people. Let it yeah. also reach that certain level. Um, how? What are you guys doing with the social competitive layer? Yeah, I think you know the, we really think about you know people just wanting to play as like the first part. You know, when some some sats is like kind of part of the first part. You know, you come for the gamified rewards, mm -hmm. and then from there you are playing the games. You obviously want to compete. You want to know how you're performing. Um, better than your peers. And so, yeah, we launched leagues, but also, you know, I think this idea of, you know, it's like really the social aspect of gaming. And like, that's where the, the first social aspect comes in is like this head to head competition. Um, and I think like esports has like really evolved out of that. Cause before we all just kind of used to play a little bit, maybe have some land parties and like, mm -hmm. now it's like full blown esports. But again, like Esports is like only the top players ever win or get to compete. Right. There's like very little that happens at the like, hey, like, you know, if we wanted to like go play Goldeneye, like there's nothing, right? Like yeah. it's really only for the elite. And so, you know, some of the features that we're launching is like more of like um like micro event or like micro tournaments. So we consider more of like micro esports, oh, like cool. letting the players really kind of craft their own tournaments, mm. host their own tournaments, and like really kind of be like these little micro influencers and create their own like little communities around our games. And again, it's because they were already doing this uh -huh. um, very, very manually. So we're just building the tools to let people like very easily, like really start to build their own like social competitions around right. our games. That is super cool. Interesting. So yeah, just a more democratized model of competition, right? Yeah. yeah that's super cool. Um, you mentioned you guys are doing some stuff with Noster, perhaps? Yes. So um, we are, so next week our game, our new, or maybe when this is out, our um, new game, Bitcoin Blocks, will come out, which will have um, the league leveling system built in, um, and it, like, from the bat. And then also we are launching what we're tentatively calling the the gaming graph um, using Nostr. So our users are really interested in Nostr. So we wanted to start playing around, also support everybody else who's building on it. So um, the first handy feature that we've built is this idea of like reputation and badges. So mm. in our leveling or leaguing system, 
there's six different leagues. Like from the worst league is Atlantic City and the best league is um, Vegas. Mm. And so every time people get to Vegas, they're like, oh, I want a badge. And I'm like, oh, we don't have a badge. <laughs> and, you know, um, so this is the first way that we're going to be able to give them a badge. So they can um, connect their um, pub key to like the, their Thunder ID in our panel in the game. And then um, when they get to the Vegas League or really every league you get, you get issued your badge for the mm -hmm. league that you're in and it will just like automatically get issued to your pub key. And then like you will have that, we'll have a viewer on our website so you can like put your pub key in and see which badges you've earned. And then the idea like really like that we're excited about is this idea of like a persistent identity and persistent um, reputation across hmm. um, platforms or ecosystems. So, you know, we want people to like, be able to like have their VIP badge in the Thunder environment and able to like transfer that to another environment and it means something somewhere else. So, mm. you know, a VIP or a moderator badge from Thunder will probably mean a lot in the Zebedee community, mm. right? You know, mo um, the people who are running Zebedee might be like, oh, I'm gonna like really kind of foster this person in our mm -hmm. community and, and allow them to like create a micro community for themselves in, at Zebedee. Similarly, like with like Stacker News, we want people to be able to like have that reputation and that reputation means something across um, ecosystems. And like that's what Nostra like really got us excited about uh -huh. first. Um, so we're doing that. And then also what will be available very soon, which is just like a fun kind of thing to show like, the power of Nostra is that you can zap the Thunder Games Nostra account and um, that zap will automatically be go to the prize pool in our uh -huh. games and so you know if people want to like play our game all at once and like want to kind of compete everybody can kind of zap a bunch of stats to the prize pool and everybody can compete against that or compete for that like oh, wow. increased prize pool so well, it's like cool. kind of breaking the fourth like the the fourth barrier or yeah. whatever between like players and the game that's so cool yeah. i admittedly have not done the deep study on nostra yet so i'm still i just know what i've heard yeah um se seems like a really big deal though yeah i mean i think it's very very early again yeah. like you know for us it's like not our main business model yeah. or something but um you know we want to play around with like what the people are excited yeah, about right, right. um yeah so it's i think it's it's very very early who knows if what will happen but i think it's just fun to play around yeah that seems to be a key element to your business strategy then is listening to your customers, right? Oh, Seeing yeah. what they're doing and then giving them the tools to do it better. Yeah. I mean, I've worked at like very, you know, at companies that just like build things yeah. and don't ever ask if people want them. And I right. think that's a very common problem with like engineering, yeah. you know, developers who are like, this is so cool. Right. It's like, it is very cool. <laughs> but, but nobody wants it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Just like the Bitcoin thing you said earlier, right? Bitcoin is very cool, but most people don't give a shit. Yeah, they will, but we got to get, it, get yeah. them to want it earlier. So yeah. yeah, we're constantly like, we have like well over 20,000 users in our Discord who are super active. So we're constantly listening and, you know, I respond to all the the bad, very few bad reviews on the App Store of the Play. <laughs> so that's me responding. So we, we're definitely listening. Nice. Very roll up your sleeves style C uh, CEO. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be there in yeah. the weeds or otherwise you kind of get lost yeah. about what you're building. That's so. cool. Um, okay. So all of this, like video games have been very instrumental in your life and your career path. Um, what do you think about just the nature of play? It's just a very broad general question. I don't know a lot about it. I haven't read a lot about it, but I find it interesting that it seems to be really important to doing other things well. Like, um, you know, I, the one thing I have heard about it is that morality emerges from play. Like you see it in animals and there's been a whole literature about that. But, um, have you just thought about that? Like what, what the nature of play is and how it's, this has shaped your life so much. Yeah, you know, I think we touched on like, okay, hey, like we've learned so much from games. Like it's allowed us to like explore, you know, questions of morality mm -hmm. where it's like, am I going to like take the bad path or the mm -hmm. good path? It like allows us to just learn in general. But I think play is like inherently social, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think as humans we want to like play we want to have social interactions and we want to transfer value and so 
I think those three things intertwined is just like where we're we've always been trying to go. Yeah. I think like back in the day, you know, how many it was like ten thousand years ago, people there's like evidence of people playing like board mm -hmm. board game like yes. games and um, you know, and they were also transferring value, right? right. And so I think, you know, in with the at the beginning of human history, like people were doing this and like we've just stripped so much of this away from like our interactions as humans so it's just like okay s social networks like there's no transfer of value it's just talking yeah they're often not fun yeah. um with games you know they are super fun they've become more social and i think um you know there's no not a lot of value transfer but i think that's what we're kind of getting at is like this emergence of people wanting to like reach the metaverse right and i think um, we're slowly getting there. I think the next social network will be games, huh. right? And I think that's what maybe Facebook is getting at with mm -hmm. Meta, um, where it's like, hey, we're having these social interactions. Um, and, you know, now all these kids, they're actually not on Facebook. They're mm -hmm. interacting in Fortnite. They're interacting in um, Roblox. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what's next from there? Like the kids are inter like having social interac interactions there, they're playing with each other. So what's next? It's like the transfer of value yeah. and that's going to come like very inherently. So I think like the nature of play, like as we kind of evolve as humans is going to become like more important like yeah. for our everyday lives. Wow. So social networks becoming video game like almost. Yes. That's incredible. I've had this long thesis. I don't know probably since I was playing Diablo as a kid, that I th I think when actually those items that I accumulated started selling for real money, I had like this little epiphany that just kept on giving and it was like the world's becoming a video game. Yeah. And what you just described sounds like the a pinnacle of that perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I, I, you see it like, and now, like, if you look at, like, I mean, Deloitte, like, all these places, like, they get into, like, gamifying anything, like, yeah. gamifying um employee expense reports yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so i think people get it where it's like as humans we want to play mm -hmm. um and we want to interact and so i think like gaming like people are just becoming like okay with that and want to like i don't know evolve into a society where like everything we do is just naturally gamified yeah 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 it's definitely fun i it's one of the most reliable ways to induce the flow state so like yeah. if you find a game you like, you it's a, it's a very enjoyable experience. And if you can tie that to doing something productive, I mean, yeah. that's a it's a pretty good deal. Yeah, I think we're I think that's I think that's like the metaverse is just like, you know, I I, I think living in some like I mean I love VR. Don't get me wrong, I love yeah. playing VR games, but yeah. it's like I don't see that being the metaverse. I think the metaverse is truly like the social the game and like the transfer of value yeah. all in like one place. Like that's just like how we live in society. Yeah. I don't think it's necessary in a goggles or in a console. I think it's just like the metaverse is just re-entwining those three aspects of humanity. Gotcha. That's what it is. So me. more like an, it's not maybe more like an augmented reality right between all the devices and things we're using. Yeah. And that's super interesting because there's a lot of data that we don't, see right now like games are being played right like businesses are competing and nations are competing there's a lot of games being played but you don't necessarily see the data about that right um so it's interesting to think if there was like a data overlay on some of that yeah i don't know it's very like your imagination mine at least just runs wild like yeah. once you start thinking of all the data that's actually being generated and if it just becomes more visible to the players yeah and like more strategies can be developed, et cetera. It's, it's like everything really a game is life, just a game. That's like, quite, that's a good question. What is a game? I mean, really? Yeah. Like we play games with each other all the time. There's rules and everything too. Just like, um, what's the one that Naval always talks about? Like a protocol is like how often, how long you should wait before you speak. Like there's a protocol there. Mm -hmm. It's implicit. It's not like we go to school and learn how long to wait, but um, that would make conversation a game even. Yeah. So. Uh, we can we can gamify it all. <laughs> it's crazy. It is really crazy when you start when you really start thinking about it. But who would have thought? Like I mean, I remember playing games and I was like, yeah, I'm like such a nerd, and people made fun of me. And now I'm like, oh shit. And now the nerds are taking this over the is world. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the metaverse you said came from that book Snow Crash. Mm -hmm. What was it like in that book? 
horrible. Wow. Like, I mean, that's where I'm like, why, why I don't want to be in the metaverse. I mean, it was, it was cool, but it was like, you know, the story is like, you know, it's just like everything is like way too connected. There's someone who controls it. Wow. You know, I mean, it is basically like if you can think of like what can go wrong with the metaverse, that's that book. Mm. Um, and same with like Red or um, Ready Player One, mm -hmm. uh, very similar to that. So I think before we create a metaverse, everyone should read those books because there's like so much that can go wrong. And, you know, talk like Ready Player One talks a lot about like inequalities that mm -hmm. like, you know, they naturally pop up in video gaming environments. Like, I mean, play to win, right? Like right. that was like a big part of Diablo 3 is like you can pay to win. Right, um, pay to win, which ruins the game. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I think what's also dangerous about games is that if that is like the next evolution of humanity and like that is our next social network is like, we have to be careful because like so much of like mm -hmm. these human vices and like these horrible things that are just inherently human are going to show up there as well. Right. Wow. So what we need more decentralization, I assume, right? Just like, yeah. Because isn't the, the bad thing in the snow crash metaverse was one guy controlled. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just like there's, you know, central points of failure and right, like, right. yeah, so. So we need Bitcoin. We if only when someone Bitcoin. would build a cool video game platform company on Bitcoin. But we need Bitcoin before we absolutely need it. Yeah. Like we need to perfect it. We need everyone comfortable with it. So when like the time comes, which it will, where yeah. everything goes to hell, like yeah. we're all prepared. You got a fat stack of sats in your solitaire wallet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yes nice. exactly does this has been a fun conversation yeah um where can people find you on the internet um definitely twitter at dickerson underscore des and then um you know people can find us all of our games on thunder dot games no vowels i didn't come up with name mm -hmm. um but yeah all of our games will be on there and the new game bitcoin blocks too awesome yeah. thank you so much for doing this yeah thank you so much for having me. this is awesome yeah happy to do it